Okay. So the sun uh, gives an anatomical classification of posterior uveitis into choroiditis, retinitis, a combination of the two, retinal vasculitis, as well as includes neuroretinitis. My slides, my slides. Okay. Etiologically classified, posterior uveitis may be infectious or non-infectious and may sometimes include the masquerades, which is not a true uveitis, but it can mimic a posterior uveitis and we always have to have a high index of suspicion, especially when we are looking at extremes of age group. Now, coming to the signs of uh, posterior uveitis, I'll start with choroiditis. An active choroiditis lesion is a deep, creamy, yellowish lesion with ill-defined margins. There is usually mild to moderate vitreous haze or cells. The overlying retina may or may not be affected, but even if affected, the retinal vessels are usually spared. Now, there are multiple patterns in which uveitis presents. So if you have multiple discrete lesions, such as this, we label it as multifocal. But if you have a creeping uh, advancement of the choroiditis with the leading edge being active, where, whereas the rest of the lesions heal, we label it as serpiginous or serpiginoid. Sometimes the choroiditis is as subtle as we see in a patient with mutes. There can be multiple disseminated plaque-like lesions as we see in ampi, and then it's referred to as ampigenous. There can be large placoid lesions as seen in patients with syphilis or tuberculosis. There can be discrete ovoid lesions as we've seen in birdshot choroidopathy. If you see multiple patches of choroiditis with pockets of subretinal fluid, then we are certainly looking at VKH or sympathetic ophthalmitis. Sometimes we might see tubercles where there is very little inflammation associated, especially in patients with miliary tuberculosis, or the choroiditis may present as a huge mass lesion as in granulomas, granulomas with lots of subretinal fluid, as well as lots of liquefaction when it becomes a subretinal abscess. Now, it's also important to know when the choroiditis has healed because at that time you don't need no treatment. So when healed, the lesions are well-defined with clear margins, it's flatter, and there are hardly any cells visible. Now, the healing pattern can be very, very subtle as we see in this patient with ampi, or there can be vigorous pigmentation as in this case. There can be chorioretinal atrophy as seen around the optic nerve head here, or in the periphery small uh, atrophic patches which are so characteristic of sarcoid. Sometimes they heal with a lot of subretinal fibrosis. Now, this is what our granuloma healed with. It looked like this. And this is how our serpiginoid healed. At the same time, new lesions also started to appear elsewhere. If you are in doubt, you can resort to investigations such as fluorescein, where active lesions show a early hypo here, followed by a late hyper. Or there can be non-invasive fundus autofluorescence, where the heal lesions are dark and the active areas are hyper autofluorescent. We should also be sure not to confuse with inflammatory CNVMs, which can be seen in posterior uveitis, as well as not confuse deposits such as large rusin or lymphoma or even secondaries and have a high index of suspicion, as I mentioned earlier. If the view of the fundus is precluded, then we have to resort to ultrasounds where we might find a diffuse choroidal thickening or even an exudative detachment, which on supine will look like this only to become bullous inferiorly in the seated position. We might see granulomas or posterior scleritis. Coming to retinitis, it's very important to identify this right at the outset because a majority of these lesions are infections, infectious and we need to have a quick diagnosis and a quick treatment. So a retinitis lesion, on the other hand, will be whitish, it will be more superficial. There should be a vigorous um, uh, vitreous reaction in most cases, which are in, in, in immunocompetent individuals. If the person is immunocompromised, then the, the vitreous cells will be conspicuously absent. If you are in a doubt, you can always run your OCT through the lesion and inner layer hyperreflectivity will confirm the presence of a retinitis. Now, these two pictures are that of a toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. So this is like the headlight and fog appearance due to the retinitis as well as the vitritis. And they often reactivate next to old lesions along with some amount of vasculitis. There's a vessel going through it. CMV retinitis occurs in immunocompromised individuals. It shows two patterns. One, where the posterior pole is commonly involved with lots of hemorrhages, referred to as a pizza pie. And the other pattern is where it's a more granular retinitis, more in the periphery. And both of these cases have very few vitreous cells. Herpetic retinitis in immunocompetent individuals presents as white necrotic patches of retinitis in the periphery with substantial vitritis. These patches spread circumferentially pretty fast and can involve the other eye. And this is referred to as acute retinal necrosis. Herpetic retinitis in immu immunocompromised individuals, on the other hand, is more of an outer retinal whitening with minimal vitritis. And curiously, the vessels are spared, giving it a cracked mud appearance. And this is called progressive outer retinal necrosis of pawn.
Bilateral macular retinitis with neuro, uh, neurological symptoms is the classical appearance of SSPE. And syphilis has made a resurgence and we should always have it, have it in mind. It can have myriad presentations and it's best to add triponymal tests to our battery of tests, largely because it's a completely treatable condition. Word of caution, a VDRL alone is not sensitive enough. Coming to non-infectious retinitis, this was a young boy who presented with multiple retinal infiltrates, significant vitritis, some amount of vasculitis, and hemorrhages, oral ulcers. His HLA B51 was positive and he was a patient of Beshe's. The other non-infection retinitis commonly seen as sarcoidosis and all the, some of the white dot syndromes. When the retinitis heals, there are varying amounts of gliosis or pigmentation depending on the involvement of the inner or the outer retinal layers and involvement of the RP and choroid. Vasculitis is inflammation of the retinal blood vessels. In an active case, we'll see fluffy exudation along the course of the vessels, and there will invariably be associated either some hemorrhages or retinal edema or cotton wool spots, as well as vitreous cells. It's important to note which ves vessels are being involved here. It's the veins, and it's called phlebitis, with hemorrhages very suggestive of tuberculosis, whereas in this patient of acute retinal necrosis, we see that there is an art arteritis. If you see skip lesions of phlebitis, think of sarcoidosis, it's very characteristic of that disease. When small vessels are inflamed, we may not actually see the inflamed vessels, but indirectly the presence of numerous cotton wool spots should alert us to that possibility, and as we see in a patient of SLE. When the vasculitis resolves, we see that the inflamed vessels are left as white thread-like sclerosed vessels, and you will not see any associated hemorrhages, edema, vitreous cells, etc. and you know it's healed. This is the dramatic appearance of a frosted branch angitis. Neuroretinitis is a peculiar inflammation of the optic nerve head, the focal inflammation of the optic nerve head and peripapillary retina with intensive exudation. So we see disc edema, we see the deposition of exudation as a complete or a partial macular star. The rest of the retinal vessels are okay, and, but you'll have a decreased vision and RAPD and color loss uh, present. If you see bilateral neuroretinitis, then uh, you should think of the possibility of Irvine syndrome, and the clue will be in the form of curious aneurysmal dilatation of the arterioles. Then we come to the basket of white dot syndromes, which are inflammatory hypopigmented lesions, and this is mainly a clinical diagnosis. And what I suggest is that we must acquaint ourselves to each of these phenotypes so that these are almost spot cases when we come across any of them. For example, this is an AMPP, which healed like this. This is a patient with PIC. This is a patient with MUDES where actually clinically we may not suspect much, but it's on the investigations that the dramatic picture uh, emerges. And finally, it's said to be pan when all the three compartments are inflamed. As said earlier, just a mere disc and macular edema is not indicative of pan because that is not a true posterior uveitis. And the entities which should spring to mind are VK, sympathetic ophthalmitis, tuberculosis, syphilis, sarcoid, the virals, toxoplasmosis, species, and others. So at the end of the examination, we should know what kind of uh, pan it is. Is it, is it active or healed? Is the fovea or optic nerve threatened? Does it fit into a well-known entity? Are there any systemic clues or masquerades? Is the patient immunocompromised? And finally, uh, we should tailor our investigations and the urgency of treatment based on these. <laughs>